Today we continue our discussion about traumatic injury to the nervous system and we move down below the brain and into the spinal cord. We're going to be talking about uh, the prevalence uh, or incidence and the symptoms that you see with spinal cord injury. For the most part we're dealing with motor and sensory deficits, uh, both to conscious and non-conscious motor and sensory function. In order to appreciate these deficits, we're going to need to review the spinal tracts and some of the major types of injury patterns that you see with spinal cord injury. <clears throat> now, the spinal cord can be thought of as a, essentially the middleman between the brain and the body. It's still a part of the central nervous system, and there's still some information processing that goes on, but for the most part, we're going to think of the brain as the processing center and the spinal cord as the hub where motor commands are translated from nervous system activity to output that controls muscles. And where the sensory input from, let's say, muscle length, for example, enters into the nervous system, makes its way up into the thalamus, and eventually up into the cortex. <clears throat> So in order for our brain to control our body and be aware of what's going on in the body, we need proper spinal cord function. Spinal cord injuries are going to be far less common uh, than traumatic brain injuries, as you can see here, as opposed to the 890 uh, cases per 100,000 per year. We'll only see about 5.6 for spinal cord injuries. Um, over the years, the average age of injury has increased from about 29 in the 1970s to 43. Uh, nowadays, the most common cause here is going to be motor vehicle accidents because that's going to cause this slinging around of the head, uh, potentially causing hyper uh, extension or flexion of the neck and leading to spinal cord injury. Of course, falls can also be a major cause, violence, and then accidental injury as well. So it's fairly similar to that of traumatic brain injury, but here motor vehicle accidents are going to play a much larger role. And you don't see a lot of uh, self-inflicted spinal cord injuries here, as opposed to traumatic brain injuries. <clears throat> so there's generally two types um, of injuries, and there's two types within each of those. So there's the quadriplegia, or tetraplegia, that's going to be caused by higher levels of injury that are going to impair motor output and sensory input from the arms and legs, so the upper and lower limbs are going to be affected. Then there's paraplegia, where we're only going to affect, uh, for the most part, the, the lower limbs there. And of these two types, either the quadra or paraplegia, these can be complete or incomplete. So with incomplete injuries, we spare some axons. So we have motor weakness as opposed to paralysis, uh, or we have more mild forms of sensory loss compared to complete injury where we sever all axons and we have complete paralysis and complete loss of sensation. <clears throat> Following a spinal cord injury, there's going to be some decrease in lifespan. So what these data are showing us here would be the average number of expected years for a 20-year-old who doesn't suffer a spinal cord injury. That's the first bar there, so that they should have a little over 60 years left in them. Any spinal cord injury is going to decrease this value uh, by about seven and a half years or so. And as you move from right to left in this plot, what you see is that the amount of years remaining decreases as a function of injury. And really it's what's the level of the injury. So lower injuries are going to have reduced impact on lifespan. But whenever you get into this region here especially, so up there in the cervical spine, here's where we're going to see uh, the more dramatic effects on lifespan, particularly in those areas that deal with respiration. can't breathe, you can't live. And so ventilator dependent um, spinal cord injury patients are going to have the, the greatest reduction in their lifespan. 
There's a couple reasons why this could be the case. Uh, the most obvious one would be due to respiratory dysfunction. So whenever we damage those neurons in the upper cervical spine, they're going to control our diaphragm and our intercostals to allow us to inhale and exhale forcefully, <coughs> including cough. Damage to these neurons is going to impair our ability to bring in fresh air and remove it, but also to clear our airway, which can predispose patients to developing pneumonia or infections in the respiratory tract. There may also be a predisposition toward infection because of impaired immune function. And there's some data out there about an uh, alteration in the, the makeup of white blood cells in spinal cord injury patients. But most likely what's going on here is just impaired airway function and being ventilator dependent means that you're going to use a ventilator to help move air in and out. And those can be prone to contamination. So if you bring contaminated air in, you're going to cause infection of the airway. This is why you'll see um, infections being more common in spinal cord injury patients, and that's going to have a detrimental effect on their lifespan. We can localize the level of injury on the spinal cord by looking at different uh, patterns of sensory and motor loss. So you're going to see this um, Asia form here and fill this out in some of your other uh, classes. But what you're going to be looking for is dermatomes uh, and, and assessing um, a reflex function. So we should remember that uh, when we have upper motor neuron damage, we should see hyperreflexia and lower motor neuron damage, hyporeflexia. With spinal cord injury, what we're doing is severing the tracts. So all those ascending tracks that we're going to come up through here and all those descending tracks, they're severed. So no more outer motor output here and below and no more sensory input here and below. <clears throat> so when you see the loss of sensory input, let's say up here, you should see loss of sensory input everywhere below there because all of those uh, tracks have been severed in the case of a complete spinal cord injury. <clears throat> so this will help us localize how high up uh, the level of injury is. Uh, again, those lesions can be complete or incomplete. So we should see um, weakness and some sensory loss, but what we'll also see with spinal cord injury is that upper motor neuron type um, spasticity. And that's because our, our, our conscious control here, that cortical spinal tract, one of the things that it has to do in order to allow for overt changes in limb position is to overcome spinal reflexes. So you can think of spinal reflexes as essentially homeostasis for muscle length. Anytime there's an involuntary change, spinal reflexes offset them. So stretch reflexes are really there to cause no neck change. Now, we take advantage of them and, and inappropriately stimulate them to cause an overt change, like with the uh, patellar reflex. We stretch the muscle far more than it ever would under physiological conditions, and we get a far greater response than we ever would under physiological conditions for the stretch reflex. So we can see it causing a change in muscle length, but that's purely something that humans have, have made up. <clears throat> Under normal conditions, the stretch reflex is there to cause no net change in muscle output. So to overcome this, the cortical spinal tract has to inhibit those reflex arcs. So part of what it does is stimulate motor neurons, but it also has to inhibit the motor, I'm sorry, inhibit the sensory feedback so that we can have a change in muscle length. <clears throat> when we lose cortical spinal tract input, two things are going to happen. We're going to lose that inhibition to our reflex arcs, <clears throat> and we're going to lose that excitatory input to our lower motor neurons. So now, lower motor neurons have to rely more on sensory input to stay alive. Hopefully we remember uh, use it or lose it, neurotrophic support, things like that. So the activity of a neuron needs to be maintained in that Goldilocks range. Not too active that we suffer active, that's, that's an E. Not too active that we um, suffer excitotoxicity, uh, but not too inactive 
such that we're not receiving any neurotrophic support. We need to stay right in this range uh, and think of this as health or something like that. <clears throat> so if our lower motor neuron there, there's our muscle, uh, loses a large component of excitatory input here from the cortical spinal tract, if this is gone, it has to beef up the strength of the remaining synapses, such as the input from sensory neurons. So when we lose this input, now neurons are more responsive to that sensory input and we get more robust reflexes as a result. So that, that's going to contribute to that hyperreflexia. We also lose the inhibition of that sensory input from the cortical spinal tract. Again, making lower motor neurons more sensitive to sensory input. So along with the spasticity, weakness, obvious sensory loss, there's the emergence of pain. And, and pain is still a little mysterious, but again, everything is relative. <clears throat> when we compare uh, whether or not something hurts, what we're doing is comparing the degree of tactile or non-painful input and the amount of painful input. If we have more painful input than tactile, that thing is deemed painful. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we have a lot more tactile input than painful input, that tactile input will not only inhibit it, but it will also essentially cancel it out in the central nervous system, so we're going to perceive it as being non-painful. But everything is mechanically gated, so even just this gentle rubbing of my arm is going to stimulate pain fibers but the tactile input is going to cancel out that pain, uh, probably at a few levels, I'd say uh, predominantly at the spinal cord, uh, but then also uh, within the central nervous system when we're doing that relative comparison, pain or not painful. So whenever we lose sensory input, because pain is so much more distributed and we have a variety of painful pathways available, and we don't have that non-painful input to cancel it out, the emergence of chronic pain is not uncommon in spinal cord injury patients. So all of that that we've talked about uh, was conscious effects. There's also a, a big effect on non-conscious motor uh, output, and that would be autonomic dysreflexia here. <clears throat> so we have our autonomic nervous system that helps regulate a variety uh, of functions, um, whether it be the output of uh, glands, uh, the output uh, of our heart, digestive uh, function, controlling the diameter of vasculature throughout our body from head to toe. The autonomic nervous system is going to regulate um, a, a variety of non-conscious processes that are critical for our uh, survival. Now, the autonomic nervous system functions in part under control of the brain. So we have a tract that goes from our hypothalamus down into the spinal cord, and that's going to help regulate the output of our autonomic nervous system. So what this illustration is showing us is just the two branches. You have our sympathetic um, on the left there. Those neurons are going to be found in the thoracic spine and upper lumbar. And then you have your parasympathetic on the right, where we have uh, neurons in the brainstem and the sacral spinal cord. Um, and these two branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are going to have opposing effects on the same target organs. <clears throat> I think sweat glands might be the exception. I think only sympathetic uh, neurons innervate those. There's no parasympathetic component. But these two are essentially going to act as the gas and the brake. And depending on the organ, one will be the gas and the other will be the brake, and they switch up. So the parasympathetic nervous system is there to, to allow for energy storage, so it's going to stimulate digestion, it's going to slow down. Uh, our heart rate, and the sympathetic nervous system is going to have the opposite effects. So the sympathetic is going to be the, the break in our uh, digestive tract, but it will be the gas for the heart. So it will increase heart rate and slow digestion. It's going to prime us for energy expenditure. <clears throat> now our emotions uh, can undoubtedly affect the, the activity of these two branches. nervous about something and your, your palms start to sweat and maybe your, your, your stomach feels a bit unsettled, that's because of sympathetic activation. And a lot of people get this whenever they have, uh, have to give up and, and give a, a, a public 
talk or something like that. And then we'll be uh, really in here. So here's our pair of sympathetic. So we essentially have a, a sympathetic sandwich here. And the parasympathetic in the brain stem and sacral spinal cord are going to act as the bread, and the sympathetic is going to be our meat. <clears throat> the hypothalamus, uh, which is located around here, is going to actually run down into the brain stem and through the spinal cord to help regulate the activity of these based on our emotions, for example. Or, or if we know that we're going to have to get up and talk soon, or we're going to go ask someone for a date, um, these are going to make us nervous, and we're going to have a bodily response to that. And that bodily response that we don't control, that, that sweating that sometimes you wish you could cancel out, you can't because it's caused by sympathetic stimulation. There will be a change in blood flow. You might have your, your face flush, for example, because we're putting more blood into our skin there. <clears throat> Those, uh, the, the activity of our, of our autonomic nervous system is going to be regulated by descending tracts from the brain, but also by sensory input. For example, if we experience, um, I don't know, pain, like we I don't, uh, step on a, a nail or something like that, that pain <clears throat> is going to ascend up and, and stimulate sympathetic output. So we have descending control and we have sensory input that controls it as well, just like our conscious motor output. Now for this, think reflexes. Whenever we have upper motor neuron type damage that we'll get with spinal cord injury, let's say, these sympathetic neurons become hyper reflexive. So something like a full bladder or socks that are too tight can stimulate sympathetic output, leading to a little bit of sweating, uh, maybe some gastrointestinal distress, but more importantly, dangerous elevations in blood pressure because the sympathetic branch here, <clears throat> via I believe the splanchnic nerve there, is going to increase blood pressure <clears throat> profoundly. I think it can get as high as about 300 millimeters uh, of mercury for the systolic pressure, which is obviously a medical emergency. Now that's an extreme figure uh, that I'm giving you, but it, it's not unheard of. It does happen. That's because of hyperreflexia. So think of this as spasticity, but instead of it being a spastic muscle, what it is is spastic autonomic output. So we no longer have that, that descending control, so the sympathetic neurons then become far more sensitive to sensory input. <clears throat> so something that's benign, like just tight socks, it causes a little bit of discomfort, can lead to dangerous levels of sympathetic output. That would be autonomic dysreflexia. So we get these autonomic reflexes that are occurring improperly. Now the different types of reflexes, of course, depend on the level of injury. When we have lower injuries, well, we still have this descending input and sympathetic output is controlled uh, fairly well, but the parasympathetic component is going to be dysregulated. <clears throat> so you get different types of outputs. With those higher levels of injury, uh, what we'll see is, is um, something like a spastic bladder and bowels. And when it's lower and we spare our sympathetic and instead affect the parasympathetic, especially if we have levels at S2 to S4, injury here is going to cause uh, flaccid bladder and bowels because we no longer have that parasympathetic output. <clears throat> so remember, sympathetic and parasympathetic act as gas and brake depending on the target organ. And so whenever we're dealing with uh, bladder and bowel function, parasympathetic is going to be the gas, sympathetic is going to be the brake. <clears throat> and that's because they're going to have different effects. They're going to act on different receptors, and some are going to cause contraction, others are going to cause relaxation of different muscles in those regions. For example, sympathetic input. Your sympathetic nervous system, let's think of our bladder, and if you're a male, you're going to have an internal uh, urethral sphincter, and if you're a female, the urethra is just going to contract all on its own. <clears throat> So there's no real sphincter. This whole thing will just contract. 
the sympathetic nervous system is going to cause relaxation of the bladder and contraction of the urethra. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is going to cause contraction of the bladder and relaxation of the urethra. So whenever we open up our urethra and contract the bladder, we urinate. That's with parasympathetic input. So normal sympathetic tone keeps our bladder relaxed and our urethra contracted so we don't constantly leak urine. And for the most part, people aren't constantly urinating uh, unless you go to Wrigleyville after a Cubs game or something like that. Then the streets flow with urine. But other than that, we usually do a pretty good job of keeping the urine inside our bladder until it's appropriate to release it. So of course we have conscious control over this as well, and that's going to happen uh, out there at the external uh, sphincter. So we'll keep our brain in there. <clears throat> so here we can cause this to contract until we want it to not. <clears throat> so here's the autonomic portion here, that, that urethra and the internal sphincter, if you're a male, and the bladder. So if we have higher levels of injury, both of these components then become hyperreflexive, and that's when we get a spastic bladder. <clears throat> Let's move on and have a look at that. So in spastic bladder, uh, we get what we call urge incontinence, where small stretches of the bladder, so as small volumes of urine build up, that stretch, you can think of that as pain, that stretch that's detected by sensory neurons is going to then stimulate the autonomic output there. <clears throat> it's going to stimulate us to then cause contraction and the opening so that we can urinate because our bladder is filling up. Now normally we have to have fairly high levels uh, of stretch so we have to have an actual full bladder to then stimulate uh, urination. But whenever you have that loss of descending inhibition because of a spinal cord injury, now small stretches cause stimulation of both branches. So what that leads to is contraction of the bladder because of parasympathetic input, but also contraction of the urethra from that sympathetic input. So these two are going to fight one another, and the net result is contraction of both. So contraction is going to win in both cases. So what you'll get is pain if you can still feel what's going on there. So you'll get, you'll get painful contraction of the bladder causing, of course, high pressure here because we've still contracted our sphincter or our urethra. <clears throat> what we can get is backflow of urine. That backflow can damage our kidneys. And we'll also get the dribbling out of small amounts of urine. So it's going to give uh, the feeling of urge, even when there really is no urgency, it's a small amount of urine, but that contraction is going to lead then to that urge incontinence. Moving lower where we have preserved sympathetic input, but we have damage at the level of the sacral spinal cord there, so we have lower motor neuron paralysis or parasympathetic output. Here we get overflow incontinence, so we have an atonic bladder. <clears throat> unable to contract anymore, so we've lost our parasympathetic input, and instead we're going to have overflow incontinence. So only when urine levels build up enough that they force their way out through the buildup of pressure do we have urination. So this is going to require catheterization in order to have um, proper urine expulsion. So you can see that that's the example on the left there. So the atonic bladder with overflow incontinence. And it depends on the level of injury, how you're going to affect bladder function. Whether you're a spastic or atonic bladder, both of those together are going to be called neurogenic bladder. <clears throat> Location matters in terms of uh, bladder function, but also everything else too. Just like everything else we've talked about. Location, location, location. So the spinal cord injury that occurs from either motor vehicle accidents or violence or falls, this could be caused by a shifting of the vertebrae. 
So a common example would be in a car accident, uh, moving forward and having an abrupt stop by the steering wheel there, causing hyperextension. This can lead to a hangman's fracture. And what we're going to do there, we're going to have hyperextension, and that's going to damage the vertebrae. And you can see a mild example of that here. <coughs> With something like this, it's not uncommon for patients to be able to then uh, get up and, and walk themselves into the uh, emergency department. They're not always this mild. In, in a case like this, so this hangman's fracture is far more severe. So that anterior shift of the vertebrae there is going to undoubtedly put pressure on the spinal cord, actually severing uh, nervous tissue. It can also affect the blood vessels that are there. It could cause rupture or it could just cause occlusion of the blood vessel. So when the vertebra shifts, it can pinch the blood vessel closed and, and the disruption in blood flow will obviously lead to uh, neuron death. Uh, just like we talked about with stroke. So same thing here. This is just going to be a trauma-induced stroke in the spinal cord. Uh, once we lose neurons or once we damage axons, uh, there's very little recovery. Um, so the same thing is true in the brain and the spinal cord because they're both central nervous system. And there's a couple things that are going to go on here uh, to reduce that regrowth. Uh, first, it could be because of uh, changes in the axons that occur. So whenever we have damage, we of course have reactive gliosis and the reactive astrocytes are going to communicate differently with neurons than a non-reactive astrocyte. And what appears to be the case is that uh, axons essentially become um, locked in place at that level where the glial scar is formed. Uh, they essentially become addicted to the um, altered extracellular matrix that's there, so they're unable to leave. So that's one possibility. Reactive astrocytes are changing um, how axons interact with their world. The other uh, contributing factor here would be the myelinating glia that are there. So in our central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes. In our peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells. <clears throat> now they both make myelin, except when they don't. Look at endocytes, and here's our Schwann cells. Central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. They will both myelinate axons. But their myelin's a little different. In the central nervous system, we have very compact myelin, and it, and it compacts differently because it has different proteins. And what these proteins do are prevent axon growth. This myelin is fluffy because part of what it needs to do is cushion nerves from physical damage because in the peripheral nervous system we're not encased in our skull and vertebral column there. And this myelin is actually permissive uh, to axon growth. So let's walk through some data that are older than I am <clears throat> to see why we think this. So uh, the experimental setup is shown here and what they're doing is culturing neurons in the middle of a dish uh, and, and it's, they have two ways of getting out. So they're, they're in this little silicone grease jail cell essentially. So they're growing neurons in the middle of a dish here. <clears throat> Here's where our neurons are sitting and they put a little silicone grease to lock them in place and they give them two ways out. They isolate the, they put it on the left, so I'll put it there, the optic nerve and the sciatic nerve. Central, peripheral. So we have oligodendrocytes here, Schwann cells here. They actually take the nerve, lay it down, and then add some grease to form the seal. There's only two ways out. You can go through the sciatic nerve or you can go through the optic nerve. 
and the neurons chose the sciatic nerve every time. <clears throat> so, these data are showing us axon outgrowth on the top from the sciatic nerve. So what they saw was axons actually growing out, but they never saw that in the optic nerve. Axons were unable to grow. They would enter, but grow no further, as opposed to in the sciatic nerve where they would enter and exit. And that's because of the, sh the, the Schwann cells in the sciatic nerve allowing the growth of axons and the oligodendrocyte preventing that growth. The, the reason for this probably has to do uh, with the fact that we expect some injury in the peripheral nervous system. So we have to allow axon regrowth and the wiring diagram is fairly simple. One neuron is going to go to one muscle fiber. It's not as complicated as wiring together the brain. And we're not really storing information in that linear tract here. We're going to do one thing contract the bicep, let's say, or another tract is going to contract the triceps. Great. That's fairly simple. But whenever we're, we're putting more complex information together, like language, learning people's names and associating with their faces, calculus, you know, all the things that we store in our central nervous system, we don't want to allow axons to radically change their connectivity because we would lose all that information that we've stored, whether it's something basic like learning how to pick up a cup and take a drink. <clears throat> or doing something a little more complicated like learning how to grow neurons in a dish and put some nerves down to let them grow out of it. Since this time we've identified a few different target proteins on oligodendrocyte derived myelin that we think are mediating this process. Now, uh, the different types of injuries that we see uh, are going to be the result of severing different axon tracts. So the spinal cord, as shown here, is just a whole bunch of tracts surrounding neurons. So the outside of the spinal cord is made of white matter, and depending on which area of the spinal cord you look at, it's going to be either motor or sensory, and of those two, it's going to be either under our conscious awareness or not. When we're talking conscious motor output, we're talking the pyramidal tracts, the cortical spinal tract, same thing. There's really three pathways that you should know as a clinician, that would be your cortical spinal tract, so conscious motor output, your posterior column, medial meniscus pathway, your conscious non-painful sensory input, and your spinal thalamic tract, which would be your conscious pain and temperature sensation. There's a whole lot more to it than that, as you can see in this diagram, but those are the three basic ones. <clears throat> Their location is going to give rise to the different types of syndromes that we see with spinal cord injury. So here's our little central canal. We got our posterior and anterior horns there. So posterior, let's go ahead and give us some posterior columns back here. There's our posterior columns. Your anterolateral pathway or your spinal thalamic tract is going to run here as well as here. So it's anterior as well as lateral. Your cortical spinal tract is going to have a lateral component <clears throat> to control the limbs and an anterior uh, component to control the trunk. So we got motor we have uh, sensory, and then I'm just going to call this pain. It's sensory, there's some temperature, but I just want a letter here. <clears throat> there are, of course, non-conscious pathways, like that dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, or the hypothalamo-spinal tract. That, that connection from the hypothalamus down to the autonomic nervous system that will run, I don't know, probably somewhere around here, somewhere in that ballpark. There are spinocerebellar tracts that allow our cerebellum to know where our body is so it can help um, shape our movements. Those are great to know, but your patient will never be aware of them uh, because they don't make it any conscious awareness. These are the ones to know. Cortical spinal tracts limbs, trunk, non-painful sensory input, posterior columns, pain and temperature, 
It's important to remember where these cross too. Your spinal thalamic tract is going to cross in the spinal cord within about three segments. Your posterior column and your cortical spinal tract. Cortical spinal tract. These are going to cross up in the medulla. So outside the spinal cord. And that's going to explain the syndromes that we see here. Now fairly straightforward with the transverse cord lesion. Here we're going to have the complete loss or incomplete uh, depending on the, the type of injury. But with a transverse cord we're going to say it's complete. Complete loss of motor and sensory function at and below the level. <clears throat> so the key here is going to be blue for posterior column medial meniscus, green for spinal thalamic tract, and then red for cortical spinal tract. <clears throat> Whenever we have complete severing, everything there and below is cut off. And so you can see that here uh, in this cartoon gentleman <clears throat> when he's had somewhere around, a, looks like about a T10, T11, something like that, uh, injury, everything's lost because we've, we have complete transverse lesion there. Compare this to a hemicord lesion, which you'll get with a, a stab wound, for example, as the more common cause here, where we have half the spinal cord lost. What we're going to see are both sides of the body affected, even though we've only affected half the spinal cord. So we still have motor and sensory loss at and below the level of injury. <clears throat> but we're going to get brown saquard syndrome here, where ipsilateral, so on the side of the injury, those sensory and motor tracts are severed. So that same side of the body is affected. But remember, these cross. So what's running up here at that level of injury is actually from the other side of the body. So we get contralateral pain and temperature loss. And that's why you'll see uh, this guy's uh, right leg is going to have um, non-painful and motor sensory loss. And his left leg there is going to have the pain and temperature loss. <clears throat> the central cord syndrome is going to be caused uh, really by a couple of different things. It could be because of a hemorrhage that then causes this big uh, syrinx or a, a fluid filled cyst to build up around the center here so this can start to expand out causing the loss of neurons and tracts that are running there. <clears throat> or it could be uh, because of the growth of a tumor somewhere around the center. So when we start to damage the center moving outward, that's going to give us our central cord syndrome. The more um, advanced or, or larger central cord lesions are going to cause sacral sparing. So it won't be quite the same as a transverse cord because we'll spare the outside here. And if we head back a couple of slides, I do want you to take note of the organization. For example, in those cortical spinal tracts, in the lateral cortical spinal tract, you'll see the cervical portions are closer to the center, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. Same thing is true for our anterolateral system. It's a little bit different for posterior columns, but generally what you're going to see is sacral sparing. All right, so we're back at our central core syndrome. More advanced versions are going to spare those sacral pathways that are more along the outside. So they won't have any loss around the genitals and, um, and the anus there. <clears throat> Anterior and posterior cord syndromes. Now these are going to be caused by uh, issues with the posterior vertebral arteries, which innervate pretty much this area, and the anterior vertebral arteries. So anterior cord is going to affect, as you can see, corticospinal tracts and your spinal thalamic tracts. So motor weakness or paralysis, as well as the loss of pain and temperature sensation. Whereas posterior cord syndromes are only going to affect the posterior columns. So you'll have preserved motor function, pain and temperature sensation, but you'll have loss of non-painful tactile sensation. And the cause here is going to be, uh, it could be shifting of the vertebrae that then affects your uh, vertebral arteries, 
uh, or, or there could be uh, some sort of occlusion. So it could be a spinal stroke, for example, that leads to these. So not a stab wound or something like that, but instead stroke in the spinal cord. <clears throat> I've got some review questions uh, for you here. If you have any questions for me, uh, fill out the questions box, comment on this video, send me an email, do something to let me know uh, what's not making sense, uh, and then I'll, I'll do my best to answer those. Stay safe out there. I'll see you later.